And today we're, we're, we're talking about influencing without authority, and, and there's a reason. I don't start with the uh, official, okay, here's the opening slide kind of thing. And, and the reason I, I don't do that is because, quite frankly, I want to, um, I want to give you a sense that this is what we're going to be talking about. You have a host of different jobs, and it, it's funny because I get the honor of doing these kinds of presentations for a variety of different types of organizations, and yet you look at this laundry list and the reality is you're never one thing. You're never just one thing. You are just about everything that's on that whole blessed list. And you're a hand holder, you're a housekeeper, you're taking care of all the little stuff. You're cajoling, you're begging, you're pleading. And the challenge we have in reality is that when it comes to getting our job done, trying to get people to follow practice, to adhere to protocol, to watch the step-by-step, -step, well, frankly, we don't have the ability to look at them and say, do it or you're going to be sacked. That's, generally speaking, not our role. Oh, uh, before I go too deep into this, let me also say that down uh, someplace on your screen, there's a, um, a little control bar, and one of the things on the control bar is the chat interface. If you come up with a question during the course of my endless chatter, feel free to go ahead and just um, drop it into the chat interface. I'll be keeping one eye on that and in the process trying to make sure that I have some common understanding of what it is that you're concerned about, where are your, well, where are your touch points. So feel free to go ahead and share what you will or offer your commentary down in the chat interface, and that way uh, we'll all get a look at it. Just make sure you're sending it to me and not to Norval, because otherwise Norval will have to cut and paste and never mind. It gets really kind of annoying. But how do you get your job done? And frankly, these are more the methodologies than any, well, methodology. We generally don't have a lot of pure authority. And we want to exert some influence, but the question is, what influences you? Now, first off, let me get rid of one basic premise. PMI did a study in the mid-1990s, said what's the number one complaint of project managers? I have all this responsibility and no authority, and that's crap. You have authority. Now, frankly, you have very little formal authority. I know that. You know, none of us get the ability to walk in, hire, fire, give raises, that kind of thing. That's not us. But we do have all these other types of authority, and I want you to think, for those of you who are working in a physical office, when you're in a physical office and you're sitting there with your headset on and you look across the sea of cubes or you look down the hall at some of the other doors and you think, wow, I'd love to have her office. I think that office would be so sweet. I'd love to have that cube. It's so much better positioned. It gets better air conditioning, you know, those kinds of things. What would it take? Do you think you could actually get somebody to swap seats with you, to swap desks with you, to give up their desk? Hmm, kind of an intriguing question. Could you actually pull that off? And I want you to think about what it would take to get somebody to surrender their desk. Now, some of you are saying, yeah, it would take the boss saying you can swap desks. Wow, that's uh, formal authority. But could you actually talk somebody into this? There is somebody in this large castle of people here. There's one of you, and I don't know who it is, but there's one of you who has the capacity to actually, well, convince others to do this. And it might be a function of you just wanted to give them a better seat because your seat's really primo and you know they've had back issues or you know that they've had uh, sunlight issues or allergy issues because they're sitting near somebody who lays on the, um, the perfume a little bit thick. Any one of those rationale. You might give them some technical reason for swapping out with you. You might pay them off. Or you could just have the capacity 
to schmooze better than anybody else. And we're going to talk about these different ways you could actually pull that off. First things first, if you want other people to respect and give you some degree of influence, if you want them to, first off, you've got to give them the sense that you respect their influence. And this goes back to your mom when you were five years old. What's the magic word? Yeah, <laughs> that actually matters. It, it's amazing how many times we will say, I need. I need is not, is not a great way to start if you're trying to influence others. I need, ha, huh, that is never where you want to go. You do not want to start there. First thing is you come at it from an angle of gratitude, that you will genuinely be appreciative. Gratitude is lost on a lot of people, and they don't realize the insane value of gratitude. My mother-in-law has got the whole gratitude thing iced. She does. I, I dearly love my mother-in-law, Carol. I really do. And she's amazing because she was a second-grade teacher. Yep, she did almost 40 years in the school systems. And the interesting thing about Carol was when she asks you to do something, she always remembers Oh, could you, could you please help me out with this? It would just mean so much to me. And she lets you know there's gratitude in there. We need to be grateful for those of whom we're expecting some level of influence. If we want to influence others, first and foremost, let them know you're grateful for the insight they can bring to bear, for the powers and capabilities they have, and for just who they are. That's an important piece of this. People need to know they're appreciated. You want to, and, and this is one you can actually test the moment we're done. After we're done with this webinar, I want to challenge you to actually walk down the hall and find somebody who owes you something. Uh, they owe you a deliverable. They owe you some piece of paper. They owe you a TPS report. I don't care what it is. Just somebody who owes you something. And I'd like you to walk down and say, Hi, how you doing? Hey, I, um, I just wanted you to know how much I really appreciate everything you bring to bear. I really do. And don't even ask him for that point. Whatever it is you're seeking, don't ask for it at that point. But just say, I really felt it was incumbent on me to come down here and tell you just how much I appreciate you. I do. And the, the, the interesting thing about that is They'll be like, oh, crap, I owe you a TPS report. I'm sorry. It's like, no, no, honestly, yeah, that would be helpful, and I'd really appreciate that as well. But I just wanted to come down and let you know that I don't tell you often enough just how much the work you do means to me and how much just having you around means to me. I appreciate you. You know, the please and thank yous count, count enormously, and we tend to write them off. No, no, that's a social nicety. We don't really need that anymore. We're living in the future. Come on. And it's, yes, we do. We need that now more than ever if we want to influence without authority. You want to influence others. The people you want to influence, well, the people who, over whom you have some influence are the people who think you genuinely recognize and appreciate their talents, their capabilities, their gifted insight, all the things they do. Demands and bribes only go so far, and saying, hey, if you do this, I'll do that, making them some kind of uh, quid pro quo is not necessarily going to get it done. First and foremost, they have to feel like it's appreciated. Oh, and how could you get somebody to swap desks with you? If you put a time limit on it, you know, for many of you, knowing that there are about 44 minutes left in this presentation, is a great comfort. That which does not kill me makes me stronger. I can do this. Yeah, and, and just knowing there's a time limit on it actually gives the person who's being asked to free up some of their sense of influence. Well, the beauty of that is, is that they're willing to give it up because they know it's not forever. They know it's not going on forever. There's no cold feet when it's only gonna be 45 minutes. People can get where they wanna go. In fact, that's another thing you can try as soon as we're done here. Walking down the hall, 
If you have a question for somebody, don't just launch into your question. If you're running to Bob in the hall, you're walking down the hall, there's Bob. Oh, geez, I wanted to get that stuff from Bob. And I, instead of just saying, hey, Bob, wanted to ask you a quick question. Now, Bob feels trapped. You just cornered Bob in the hall. Not a good thing. But if instead you start that whole conversation with, hey, Bob, um, I just need two minutes of your time, just two minutes, because I had a quick question for you. Oh, it's only two minutes. I can do anything for two minutes. You have just exerted and given yourself a little bit of authority for a whopping two minutes. You just freed up Bob two minutes from now. And Bob's like, wow, thank you. I'm free. I know I'm going to get out of here. Hallelujah. And that's one of the beautiful things about influence. You have influence if people know for how long they're going to be held prisoner. If, by contrast, you simply go, oh, you really want to make it horrible, walk into somebody's workspace, plop down in their cube or their office. Hey, uh, wow, I'm glad you're here today because I just wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions. They're, they're prisoners in their own office. Ah! Yeah, you are not exerting a lot of influence right now. You are not getting, you are not winning hearts. And that's kind of important. You need to be winning hearts. You need to be giving people the sense of that, wow, this has shared value. This matters. And indeed, you get that by virtue of a couple of very basic fundamental human things. One, a little bit of please and thank you, thank you. And for two, giving them a sense of just how far that whole relationship has to last. If, it, if you just plop in and say, hi, I just wanted to talk to you for a couple of minutes. A couple of minutes, they're thinking, is that two minutes or is that two hours? When are you getting out of my workspace? That's not influence. That's a threat. The other piece of this, oh, yeah, there you go. Now you know you're in a uh, project management geeks class, and that is because uh, I have a WBS. I, I feel complete now. But it goes to what actually gets you gung-ho. You like hanging out with people who make you feel better about yourself. That's one. That's one thing you can do, and we were just talking about that. But if you want to feel better about yourself, some of you have what's called a high need to achieve some of you are high need to achievers. And the high need to achievers, what gets you motivated? Getting stuff done. Getting stuff done. Yeah. You actually have that capacity. And one of the fun things that you can do in getting stuff done is define what done looks like. Knowing what done looks like. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you a chance to leverage the chat interface because what I'm going to ask you to do is to give me a couple of quick answers to this down in the chat interface. I'm about to give you a question, and it's a very simple question. You're hosting a meeting to present a new approach to your customer. You're hosting a meeting to present a new approach to your customer. And on your list of things to get done is host meeting. My simple question is, what does done look like? That's a simple question, and if you can find the chat interface, it's the little thing that looks like a cartoon bubble in the tools. But I'd like you to just type in a quick answer to what's done look like, and make sure you're sending the chat to me or to everyone. Either one is fine. But go ahead and uh, see if you can drop that down into the chat interface. Done looks like, oh, a clean desk means the meeting's done. Meeting attendees agree to the meeting. Oh, that means the meeting is done. Records of meeting content and personnel attendance. That person's going for minutes. Yeah, we've got, oh, minutes sent. Meeting notes sent. That's a good one as well. Now, you should listen to those. Buy-in for the outcome. Getting buy-in on the, oh, so this is the minutes have been sent. Everybody looked at the minutes and said, I wept openly. It was absolutely perfect. Your mom and I are proud. Understanding on both sides. Good luck with that one, Susie. That's going to be extraordinarily difficult. Oh, one person said, hey, as soon as I get the meeting invites out, I'm out. I'm done. I don't even have to go to the meeting. Hallelujah. 
Wow. This is a long one. You have effectively communicated the topics you wanted to cover with the customer, and they have been documented and understood by all parties. <gasps> wow. That's a serious answer. The key. Done. If you were thinking done was, hey, I got the conference room scheduled, I got it all set up, I'm out. And somebody says, oh, no, 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 we want you to come to the meeting and take minutes. Oh. Well, okay. But a moment ago, you thought you were done, and now you're not done. Oh, <laughs> this is a great one. The customer nods in agreement toward the end of the meeting. Yep, you know you're done. Now, that's nice, except you probably want to capture that affirmation afterwards in meeting minutes. Meeting minutes. So you distribute the meeting minutes, and you go, I'm done. You're not done. And this is the horror of how we lose influence over people. This is actually how it happens in very small increments and in small degrees. And the reason I say that is because in small degrees – and, and you can let go of the answers now. We're, we're done with that piece. But the point being is we have different interpretations of what done looks like. And if you've got somebody you're working with, somebody you really need their help, somebody you need their gifted insight, and you say, all I need you to do is just host this meeting. Oh, sure. And they get it all scheduled. They get a conference room. They get it all planned out. They send out the meeting invites. And they go, hey, it's all set up for you. I'm done. Oh, no, 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 I need you at the meeting. What you just did is you just lost influence with them. The reason you lost influence is because they thought they were done. And then, to boot, they sat, they took the meeting minutes, they sent them out, and they said, okay, thanks a lot. Hey, when the replies come back on those minutes, make sure you embed them in the final version that you're going to send out. Each time you add on a layer of undone to done, dun, 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 dun. It gets dark and evil. It really does. It gets really, really painful. What gets people motivated, it's not just the plan. It's having a clear understanding of what the plan means and what done looks like. You want to influence others. You want to have people who have a clear understanding of what their role in the universe is. Well, part of that is knowing what done looks like. Think of all the things that motivate you in the day-to-day. Now, some of you bump into somebody, and, and as a matter of fact, I'm probably stopping you from doing that. You can do it at 1 o'clock, though, if you're Eastern time. And that is, uh, I'm stopping you from getting together with some of your friends. Yeah, yeah, friend time. Sometimes over lunch you get together and you just get a chance to chat over a hot dog or something. But you have that conversation. And there are certain people, when they walk through the door, I don't know who she is, I don't know who he is, but... Emily walks through the door, and you're like, oh, wow, my day is made. My life is complete. Wow, that's great. Other people walk through the door, and you're like, I'm doomed. It's Beavis. Shoot me now. Yeah, it's a motivating moment. It's a matter of deciding, are we the, the people who actually drive that sense of, oh, wow, she's stopping by? Or are we the people who people sink their heads into their hands and pray for the sweet embrace of the grave. If you want to be influential, part of that is being able to motivate. Not rah, rah, cheering people on kind of stuff, but at the same time, being able to have a little bit of fun, being able to enjoy the company of others, being grateful for the company of others. These are the things that start granting us a degree of influence. My, uh, some people, myself included, have a problem, and I acknowledge that this is one of my problems, and that is I love sharing stories about what's going on in my world. And I catch myself sometimes because sometimes I'll realize I've got to shut up long enough for the person on the other end of the conversation to share what's going on in their world. Wow, that's hard. Because you get so excited about what's going on in your universe. You really do. And, it, and it's justified. You have a great universe. But we really do need to be that listening ear. Kind of an interesting television moment for you, and, and hopefully I've got a few followers or adherents on all this. Many of you are probably unaware of what the number one tele, most watched, 
television show in the entire world is, aside from the World Cup. But ongoing serial TV, episodic TV. Hmm. Now, kind of think about that for a sec. Do you know what it is? NCIS. Ah, oh. NCIS. And I will lay odds that at least a third to a half of this audience has actually watched more than one episode of NCIS. And the thing that's interesting, for those of you who have never seen this show, the lead character is a guy named Gibbs, and Gibbs has an interesting trait. He is, well, tight-lipped. He doesn't talk a lot. He generally keeps his mouth shut, and he lets others do the talking. The intriguing thing about his character, both in television and if you're dealing with someone like it in the real world, is you naturally gravitate to them because you know they're not filling the void just to fill the void. It's kind of amazing. If you want to give people a chance to actually feel like their world matters, give them a chance to, well, hold the floor. Give them a chance to actually know what's going on in the universe around them. That's really where we need to be. Part of this gets down to focus. Yeah. And you want to feel like you're important. You want to feel like you're making other people important. Give them focus. And I I don't know if you can find it, but there is a hand-raising function here somewhere. I'm looking to see if I can find mine. I've got mine next to mine. Um, If you can find that, I'd like you to raise your hand. If you're an early, early morning person, if you're one of the crazy early morning people, you get into the office at oh, dark 30. You're there before anybody else. And if you could raise your hand, if somebody can figure out how to do that. And if you can't, well, that's on. Oh, perfect. I just saw a hand. There we go. Rochelle, Rich. Perfect. I'm in the R's, obviously. But Rochelle and Rich, these are two of the early morning people. And I can actually tell you part of Rich's life and part of Rochelle's life. They get in at oh, dark 30. And you know what's going on at oh, dark 30 in the office? Nothing. Nothing except Rochelle and Rich. And they are there at oh, dark 30. And i got to tell you what the first hour of their life at the office looks like. These two are a house of fire. They are machines. They are achieving what Mihai Csikszentmihalyi referred to as flow. Yeah, they've got flow, which means that they are just sitting at their keyboards. They are hammering away. Last night's email, vanquished, knocked out of there, no problem. They are just humming along. They are making serious tracks. And the beauty of being Rochelle and Rich is that for that first hour, life is good, rich, and wonderful because they are getting stuff done. And you know how they feel about their jobs at that point? Good. Why? Because they have flow. She sent me high studies on flow, actually talked to the fact that this is one of the most highly motivating moments that an employee can experience. On the job, when you're going through flow, when you are actually having that moment, when you feel like you are actually getting stuff done, get out of my way, I'm on a roll, there's a certain beauty to that that very few other things in work can achieve. It's a magic moment. And then it happens. Oh, Rochelle, thank heavens you're here. Yeah. I just wanted to drop in for a couple of minutes and suck the life out of the room. And Rochelle's like, no, 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 I was having flow. (laughs) It was going so well, and now you. Now, first off, you want to win Rochelle's heart. You want to win Rich's heart. You want to have direct influence over them. Find ways to help them achieve flow. If you see somebody heading for their workspace, hey, hey, don't go in Rich's office right now. He's, he, he's crazy busy right now. You would be doing him the biggest favor on earth if you just let him keep working on what he's working on. 
I'll only be a minute. No, no, no. If I can help you, I'll help you. But please, whatever you do, don't disturb Rich. Now, if Rich hears this conversation going on down the hall, I want you to know something. He just heard you allowing him to have flow. He heard that magic moment. He heard that joy. And he was thinking to himself, oh, I owe her one. Yeah. That's, that's part of the beauty of this is you have the ability to help others achieve flow. And Eli Goldratt in his book Critical Chain talks about the same thing. They call it different things, but frankly, the two of them go a long way towards clearly establishing here's what it is and here's how we can actually leverage a little bit of, well, influence over the whole deal. We actually have that capacity. I was talking earlier about the whole notion of knowing what done looks like. You know, there's a certain joy in earning a credential, and, and most of you have one credential or another. I'm not sure which one you've got, but you've got a credential, and bravo to you. Um, the, the real key here is when you got the credential, you were like, oh, I'm done. Now, any of you who have ever watched MASH or know anything about World War II know that service points were introduced as the means to get to go home. Interesting thing about service points, they kept changing. Originally, to go home, you needed 12 service points. And some people, just before they got their 12 service points, found out you had to get 14 service points in order to get home. And playing soccer with my son when he was little, he used to always keep moving the goal. No, you didn't make the goal, Dad. It's not the oak tree. It's the back fence. It was not fun playing soccer with my son. The key is when we know what done looks like, when we have clear goals, when those goals are clearly delineated for us, we win. And they should be meaningful goals. Um, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Greg Garrett wrote the book, World Class Contracting. And in his, in his book, Greg came up with a great term that I dearly love, he said we should be very careful about creating inch stones. Yeah, we don't want inch stones. That's where you walk down the hall and you go, hey, Sally, I want you to know you're an amazing human being. Job well done. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, appreciate it. And for a moment, Sally's feeling really good about herself until she hears you walk down to Samantha's office going, hey, Samantha, just so you know, that was a job well done. And she's like, oh, he's just working the room. He's going to every single room and all this. No, no, no. Milestones need to be significant. They need to be meaningful, and they need to be about us. They genuinely need to be about us. We need to make sure that we have given people some sense of what their goal is and what it is for today and for down the road. And those goals shouldn't be things, and it was interesting, a couple of people wrote, understanding is what they want to achieve at the end of the meeting. Understanding is not a goal. I'm sorry, as much as I wish it were, it's not. And the reason, it's a quality reason. You can't measure it. It's very hard to measure understanding. What I can measure is, did people implement what was said? Did they, did they have the tools now? Do they know how to use the tools that have been shared with them? That's what is achievable as a deliverable and as a milestone and as a goal. But if we don't have some way of metrically measuring it, we frankly have put ourselves into a world of hurt. We put ourselves in a position where, well, frankly, life is getting pretty darn difficult. It's going to be very, very difficult to move forward. A goal, a very simple goal. What does done look like? Well, let's talk about that meeting. The meeting is done when the meeting minutes have been issued within 48 hours of meeting completion, comments returned within 48 hours of minute distribution, and any comments that were made are incorporated as part of the minutes, and the minutes are both stored on SharePoint and archived and made available to the members. Can you measure that? Actually, it can. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But 
note. That took a lot of work. That's a long statement. But at least we know what done looks like. You know, part of the problem, too, is the whole notion of expectancy theory. And expectancy theory is one of those little gifts that we were given by a guy named Victor Vroom. Victor Vroom came up with expectancy theory. And let me give you the guy's name here. Oh, let me change the color of my marker here. There we go. It is hold on, Victor Vroom. Sounds like a Marvel comic character. Victor Vroom came up with expectancy theory. And expectancy theory is the belief that we can achieve our goals. The belief that we can achieve our goals. And some of you have, have made the foolhardy mistake of attempting home repair. I'm sorry. I really am. Yeah, because you have tried to do home repair. And, you know, it was so small. It was so insignificant. It was just all I want to do is fix the windowsill out in the living room. Now, that seems like a measurable goal. I just wanted to fix the window. So, oh, what does fixed look like? Well, you get out to the window sill and you, okay, there's one little chip of paint. It's about the size of a quarter. It looks offensive, but it's not really a big deal. So you get down to the basement to get the paint. You kept it in the little baby food jar. That was smart of you. And uh, you, you bring the little baby food jar of paint upstairs. It's been down there for 15 years and you're shaking it. You get upstairs, you pop that sucker open, and the paint inside is hard as stone. Ah, fiddle. So now you have to run up to the paint store, and you take another little chip of paint next to the chip that's already on your windowsill, because you're never going to be painting over it anyhow, and you get it so that you can match the paint exactly. Ha! Problem solved. Go up to the paint store. They use their little laser machine to figure out the exact color mix. Boom! Now you get home, you've got a little can of paint, and you're ready to go. And as you're about to start painting, you realize that it kind of has a little divot, and I don't know how that came about. So, well, I'll fix the divot. So you sand it down smooth, and you realize it's a little deeper than you thought it was. So you run downstairs, get some wood putty. That's also now solid as stone because you haven't touched it in 15 years. So you run back up to the hardware store. You get a little thing of and by the time you're done three weeks later, you're buying lumber. What happened? Well, what happened was the inability to influence. If anybody asks you to do any home repair, your answer is going to be immediate and visceral next time around. No. No. If you had known going in, you might have been able to handle this. But the reality is you didn't know. There's a way to deal with them. Now, I use this in a lot of my presentations, and I do it because it's been profound in my life. And do you know what done looks like? Part of this is people start talking about process rather than done, and that's a big part of influence. And I want you to know somebody who had amazing influence over my life. Back in, wow, I was much younger then, back in 1987, I had the honor, I was, in, I was in a completely different career, by the way, 30 years ago. I was a member of the media. Sorry. Yeah. I was the news director at WASH Radio in Washington, D.C. And I had the Sunday morning talk show. You know when you go fishing for music and you can never find it? That was me. Yeah. And I got to interview every celebrity coming through town, flacking a book. And what was interesting was one of the celebrities I had the honor of interviewing was Mr. Rogers. Yeah, he's got the whole movie out now and all that stuff, very cool. But yeah, Mr. Rogers, the it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, Mr. Rogers, that Mr. Rogers. And I had the intriguing experience, and the reason this is germane here is because Fred came in and I was just ready, let's get the interview going. We sat down for a minute, and he knew that this was an important set of questions. He knew these mattered, and he asked me the most important question I was ever asked in my life. It's a project question. It's a quality question. It's an influence question. You want to influence others. Learn the Mr. Rogers question. 
and, and I say that with all sincerity. This question was, when we're done here, how do you want the world to look different? That was his question. When we're done here, how do you want the world to look different? Wow. I expected a lot of things out of Mr. Rogers. I did not expect him to be flippin' profound. I really didn't. And the intriguing thing is it's a quality question. It's a personal question. Try this on your spouse next time you're having an argument. Yeah, when your significant other comes along and you just aren't seeing each other's point, Dear, when we're done here, how would you like the world to look different? It cuts through the current set of crap, whatever that might be, and it gets them to the insight that, oh, you actually care about what I'm thinking. How cool is that? It is fun to be us. It really genuinely is. It's a great place to be. And the beauty of it is, is it opens the doors so that we have a shared understanding of what done looks like. Charismatic authority is a whole different other kind of influence. Charismatic influence. Bill Clinton, many people labeled as a charismatic leader. And his big, and if you ever hear anybody doing a Clinton impression, they always say the same thing. I feel your pain. Now, there's a simple enough question. Did he feel your pain? Hmm. Did he? Now, some of you are like, no, he has no idea what my pain is like. Actually, let me suggest to you, go on Google Maps, go to Street View, and virtually drive the streets of Hope, Arkansas. And I would suggest to you that at some point or another, he did feel your pain. Yeah, I, I genuinely believe that. And what's intriguing about that is he was able to convince people that that indeed was the situation. He knew what you had been through. He understood the, the angst and the challenges in our lives. And that's what lifted him or escalated him into the presidency. And just so we give both sides equal time, Ronald Reagan, famous for that second bullet, it's morning in America. When Reagan said that, the shining city on a hill speech, oh, my gosh, he gave a lot of people the sense it was okay to be wrapped in the red, white, and blue. And when you feel like other people hear you, they have influence over you. They do. They genuinely have influence. My brother-in-law, Dave, that's him at the bottom, in case you're wondering, that does not look like Clinton or Reagan to me. No, that's my brother-in-law, Dave. It is. Dave is a Pentecostal used car salesman. Huh? Yeah, I'll explain. Dave has influence. He was a car salesman before he changed into his next career, which was pastor. Yeah, weird career path. But he was a car salesman for decades. And the interesting thing about my brother-in-law, Dave, he was an amazing car salesman. Any of you know anything about car sales? Know that the, the whole goal of the person who's selling you the car is to influence you. They have no authority over you. In fact, you have authority over them, and yet they are there to sell you a car. When Dave was moving cars, kind of an interesting background on him. He'd get hired at a dealership, and they'd always say, well, Dave, we'd like to put you on commission to start, and then later on we'll bump you up into the salary range. And Dave would always respond the same way, no thanks. I'll take commission, but I'll never take a salary. They're like, well, you know, you might have a slow month or two. And Dave was like, no, no, as long as we can agree today, before I ever start working for you, that my life with you is going to be pure commission, I'm on board. And, of course, the dealerships were always like, yeah, cool, color us there. Dave was insanely charismatic. He could move over 20 cars a month. Now, those of you who know anything about car sales know that that's not good. That's impossible. And yet, Dave did it month after month after month. He consistently made more than the executives 
at the car dealerships at which he worked. And the reason is he just moved cars. Now, you have this vision of him, don't you? You can see him there, but you have this vision, him in the suit and tie, eeling his way across the lot. That was not my brother-in-law, Dave. He exerted influence by feeling your pain, by knowing what your goals were. Matter of fact, Dave is the king of flannel. He loves the lumberjack shirts and blue jeans. That's his idea of fine attire. And to boot, he learned the power of the 15 seconds of silence. For those of you who don't know, that's the American cultural threshold of pain for silence. We don't handle silence well as a culture in America. We really don't. If you just count down that time in your head and you're trying to get information from somebody, you want to influence them, ask them the question, and then, here comes the hard part, shut up. Oh, yeah, that's murder. It really is. It's very hard to keep your mouth shut during a conversation like that. And, and the reason being is because you, if, if they're not saying anything, generally we want to fill the void. But if you can stand going 15, 14, 13, 12, doing the countdown in your head, by the time you're down to two or one, the other person, generally speaking, will snap like a twig. They will crack like an egg. And that's really good data to have. Because it gives you some sense, how can I extract information from them? How can I, well, have greater influence? Dave always gave people the sense that he really, genuinely cared about what they were driving. And as a result, he was inspired as a car salesman. He did things that other people only fantasized about in that business. What do the people in your organization want? Can we do these things? Take a look at that list. Can you talk to a senior VP and say, hey, you know, these three team members have just been going great guns. It would really be an honor for them to get to have breakfast with you and just to chat with you about the organization in general and and just basically feel like they're noticed. Now, for one, you just stroked the honcho by saying you're important enough that it would mean something to my team members to actually get that breakfast with you. And to boot, flip that around, you go to the team members, I set it up so that you could have a, a breakfast with the senior executive vice president. I just wanted you to get a little visibility in the upper echelons. So that'll be next Tuesday, just so you know. Setting up that kind of stuff actually lets them know you're thinking about them. You have to have some kind of organizational organ, some you know newsletter, blurb, most of those come in your email and you look at it and you go, oh, the, uh, the Friday Times, and delete, and off it goes into your spam box. No, unless you know you're in it, particularly your picture is in it, and it's for something you did. Also, if you're getting those, if you get the house newsletters, I have some bad news for you. You actually have to start reading those. Because if you want to influence others, you have to know what's going on in their world. If you see that little blurb and it says, oh, Susan just won the Seekers Award. And it's like, the Seekers? Well, I don't even know what the Seekers Award is. But you're walking down the hall, you see Susan, and you get to go, hey, um, Susan, just want to say congrats on the award thing. I, I, saw that, uh, I saw that you picked that up. Well, for one, she's going to be stunned that you even read the newsletter. But for two, she's going to be duly impressed that you thought enough to actually bring it up to her. You actually gave her her moment in the sun. And that was an awfully nice thing to be able to do. That was actually kind of a a nice turn. Giving people a chance to, well, move up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, to, to get a sense that they're doing something. You want to change the way people look at you and you want to be able to influence them without authority, these are some of the little things that you can do that can change their world. Also, (laughs) this is always so hard. you got to be fun. Oh, fun? Yeah, fun. You think about the people you would go to the wall for in your organization, the people who they ask you to do something, yeah, you'd go to the mat. And, wow, there you are. 
generally speaking, at some point or another, you've thought of them as being, well, fun. You actually thought they knew how to have a good time. Part of that is, is this stuff, it is the stuff we've already talked about, but also in the corporate world, what else constitutes fun? It's, it's opening doors, it's opportunities. It's learning how to make things sing, how to make things happen. Somebody in this room right now, in this virtual room, actually knows how to get something purchased. I don't know who you are, but you have figured out the procurement nightmare. Wow, look at you. And you know, the interesting thing about you is somebody catches on to the fact that you actually, that Wendy figured it out. And it's like, oh wow, you know, Wendy's got this. She already figured out how to buy stuff. Oh my gosh. And suddenly Wendy has all this technical authority. She's got bureaucratic authority. She knows how to make things happen. And it kind of moves her up the echelons. It makes her feel better about herself. That's fun. It's also fun when we have some sense that we're actually in control. That's part of it. That's a big deal. Having fun is, well, God willing, fun. And one of the things we really do want to be doing is making sure that we have a common understanding as to, well, how much control do you actually need? Some of us are control freaks. Some of us are not. Some of us genuinely don't sweat that much about it. We don't lose sleep over this stuff. And the reality is that we need to be clear on the people we're working with, what's their idea of, well, control and being controlled. Now, the good news is, we're down to about our last seven minutes. We're down to about our last seven minutes together. I think the dark side of this is, if I'm right, I'm not sure, but it gets to, well, what can you control? Take a look at the things you can control. In one office I worked in, they got rid of our Starbucks coffee service and bought El Cheapo coffee. People got really, really upset. The manager I worked for started bringing in coffee on his own, Starbucks. Started bringing in the, 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 the bags of Starbucks coffee because he couldn't stand it. Just couldn't bring it. Could bring himself to listening to everybody complaining. He actually had some modicum of control. And yes, it cost him a little money. But you could imagine how much influence he exerted after that happened. He made that special. He made that significant. He also was one of the people who couldn't live with bad coffee. That kind of matters. You know, but the reality is if we understand the environment, if we know what we can tolerate, what we can't tolerate, that's going to make all the difference in the world in terms of our ability to influence. We need to be the ones who are looking across this panoply of opportunities, and figuring out which things actually give us the greatest joy in our work. Influence is born not just out of control. It's born out of genuinely appreciating the people you work with, finding ways to let them know they're appreciated, also identifying the means and the capabilities to let people know that we understand basic human needs like the need of time. We have five minutes left in our presentation this afternoon, so while I do my little wrap-up piece, I'd like you, if you have any questions, to go ahead and throw them down in the chat interface. I'll pick them up down there, and then we will uh, we'll cycle back. So uh, and I'll try and answer whatever questions come up down there. But while you're doing that, while you're hammering through on that, be thinking about this too. Three things that are good in your future. If you're focused on those and if you're helping others to focus on theirs, asking them the question, what would you love? Those are questions worth asking. Those are questions where you can say, what would you genuinely love? And people always say, I'd love to retire. Yeah, okay. Well, what's it going to take to get us there? How far down the road are we looking? What can we do to make that happen in a way in which you're genuinely happy? 
And, you know, it's funny. Some people say, all I want to do is just retire and become a Walmart greeter. And, you know, it's funny. I know a Walmart greeter. And I can tell you, she is genuinely happy in her work. And you might say, well, Carl, that, that would be the exception rather than the rule. Not necessarily. It's the sense that there's a better day. It's a sense that she's got exactly what she was looking for as she retired, because she never did want to retire. She enjoyed all the social interaction. That was the part that mattered to her. And we need to have a sense of continuity. I'm not seeing any questions down in the chat interface, so let me uh, go ahead and just pop on out here to the promise of continuity. That's my email address, carl at carlpritchard.com. Vanity, thy name is Carl. If there's anything I could do to facilitate your efforts in making some of this happen, pop me an email. If you just need a quality management shoulder to cry on, pop me an email. I will always get back to you within 24 hours. Oh, there's the promise, and there's the influence. So I will always get back to you within 24 hours. I will make that happen. I will also do whatever I can to ensure that you have a positive experience in terms of trying to get others around you, well, a little more influenced. And with that, Norval, if you're still with us somewhere, I presume I'm still you are. Here. Okay, there you are. And that's the name of that tune. Great. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, we do have uh, another, well, we have less than two minutes before the top of the hour, so if anybody does have questions for Carl uh, at the last minute, uh, do please uh, type them into the chat box. Uh, as you're doing that, I'll uh, give you one more reminder here that next Tuesday, July the 24th, will be our next webinar. It will be Organizational Excellence, a Formula for Success uh, with Dawn Ringrose and Nathan Lynch. Um, not seeing any other questions here, Carl, on my side. Are you seeing any on yours? Um, yeah, the only, uh, just, just some thank yous, and so thank you, Carolyn, thank you, uh, Hermione, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, looks like that's probably going to about wrap it up for today. Uh, we'd like to thank Carl once again for presenting for us today. Thank you. And also like to uh, thank all of you for joining us as well. Uh, we look forward uh, to seeing or most of you online uh, next week on Tuesday. It will be 12 noon Eastern time. Um, a lot of you have registered already. Uh, there's still opportunities to do so between now and then, so uh, we hope to see you next week. Uh, until then, I hope everybody has a great rest of the day, and uh, uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks again. Bye now. <laughs>